Thank you, Sumi, and thank you, Centers and the Center for Biomedical Ethics for inviting me uh, back to one of the Centers conferences. I think the last time I was here was in 2017. Um, and it's great to see many friends and former colleagues as well as the broader uh, representation of people in health and community care, government and academia in today's audience. Um, the subject matter of this conference is practical ethics, ethics being our guidepost for doing well in our individual, interpersonal and professional lives and as a society. The practical context of this talk is aging in place or continuing to age at home and in our communities, a policy objective that our society has embraced as you have uh, heard um, Mr. Raymond Chua uh, describe, and it's a fantastic landscape that he has <laughs> um, uh, talked about uh, a few minutes ago, uh, really quite uh, mind-boggling how far the developments have come. So I'd like to start off by highlighting a point about the field of bioethics. Aging and aging societies reframe many questions in bioethics today, um, enriched by gerontological and ongoing interdisciplinary research on aging, a focal question for bioethics is how can we live well in old age and in aging societies? So this research has uncovered many uncertainties facing aging societies, such as living longer in better or worse health, aging unequally, facing changing relationships, social isolation and loneliness, planning for frailty, dementia and care support, navigating more complex end of life decisions, as well as developing the goals of health and social care. So we see that many choices and decisions have to be made. And the question that ethics addresses is, how can we find the good? Uh, how can we build on that in an aging society? And that is a whole of society question, not just for professions, for government, but for every single citizen. So, here are some challenges and responses as, as I've indicated. Over about 50 years, amid great achievements in public health, much has and is being done about responding to the challenges that I've mentioned, longevity, frailty and dementia, unequal aging, changing uh, relationships and structures and supports, as well as the evolving goals of medicine. Um, so, if you look at that simple chart, that, uh, the simple chart that I've put up, uh, you, you hear more conversations about uh, what it means to, to age in good health, what is healthy longevity and aiming for a longer health span and a shorter period of uh, frailty. Um, also, what is purposeful living in old age? And here uh, in NUS is a brand new center um, for purposeful living in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences uh, doing research in this area. Um, and might I mention also um, uh, the work of uh, Professor Kalyani Mehta, who will be here in, uh, who will be with us on, a, on, the, on Zoom in a hybrid uh, session uh, at the end of the, the last session of this conference. Uh, for years of work on um, the role of culture and religion uh, in, in the life of the aged person. Um, and in the area of frailty and dementia, there is more attention all around the world in supporting capabilities and dignity in old age. Um, and that includes non-discrimination greater social participation, advanced care planning, and a respect for end-of-life decisions. With regard to unequal aging, there is a need, as you have heard uh, Mr. Raymond Chua uh, talk about the, the attention that this society has placed in tackling the wealth, education, and technology divide. Um, in addition, uh, there has been a concern uh, on women's longevity because women take, take up the bulk of caregiving uh, responsibility 
uh, in many societies, and they age uh, in poorer health with greater disability and less financial adequacy. And um, I think last year we heard uh, it debated in Parliament, the women's, the PAP women's and youth wings um, had raised uh, a white paper in which they discussed uh, the issue of inequality for women caregivers in the society and how to better support them. Uh, we see also um, what's been uh, talked about or described as a global epidemic of loneliness uh, as society changes and as society's age. Um, and um, I think every, everywhere we know that uh, HDB has been, uh, and URA have been working on redesigning housing and community spaces. Um, we've, we've just heard about the active aging centers in, in every neighborhood um, of uh, befriender and befriender training and bystander training, uh, training the shopkeepers, the hawkers, the uh, postmen to keep an eye out for seniors in the community. And uh, of course, um, I think more and more um, in caregiver support groups, I think we really have room to extend um, this to life course conversations, including discussion, discussing questions like, is aging in place right for me? Um, or do I need to move to another location? Do I have mobility limiting health conditions? Do I have conditions that limit my mental function? Is my home suitable for old age living? Can I afford to modify it and so on? And this last bit on evolving goals of medicine. Um, today, I'd like to spend most of the, 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 actually the rest of this lecture on this question of what health and social care means. And uh, what health and social care means, I'd like to suggest, is a focus on long-term care, the long-term care of every person uh, um, that, uh, that comes under the care of the health and social care system. Okay. So health and social care integration introduces a new lens or theme in healthcare ethics that has to do with the life course of patients and clients and their long-term care. And it's significantly different from the more familiar models of clinical decision making, which I'm sure you know, uh, most of the people in this, this, this room are very uh, well versed in. It's also significantly different from attending to the social determinants of health, and let me explain what I mean. So even back in 2017, 2018, when I presented this report at Centre's conference in Singapore and the ICCC conference in Oxford, Good Care at Home for Older People in Singapore by the CBME, um, uh, the Oxford Ethos Centre and the Hastings Centre, uh, a report supported by the wonderful Lian Foundation. It's hardly new to talk about long-term care, but not a lot was being discussed about good care at home for older people and the system and social changes that must accompany it. Now I think the contents of the report are truer to life and it's time to revisit uh, fresh reflections. In the report we said, here are some key domains for ethical reflection in health and social care. Supporting agency and good choices for care. Is it a good choice for me to age in place at home? Or to relocate to where care support is better, nearer to my children, or to extend a family, or to assisted living facilities, etc. Okay. Um, another area is supporting long-term care relationships with trusted family members or relatives or friends, building trust with your doctor and senior care manager in integrated health and community care. Oh, might I mention also, you're very important, your um, nurses and uh, you know, your home care teams that come to, to help you, you know, help change the feeding tube or you know, to, to deal with wound care and so on. So in the background are some existing tensions um, sorry, I think I missed a point there. Yes, I missed a point. Um, the third point, uh, clarifying responsibilities in different sites of care, um, such as how would professional support informal caregivers at home in managing daily care, for example, through their home care visits and an emergency hotline and so on. 
uh, how do you define the boundaries of re um, responsibility for formal caregivers like professionals and informal caregivers at home? Yeah. In the background are some existing tensions. Uh, you have tensions over goals and monopolies. There, this is a system in transition. The emerging conceptions of old age and, um, you know, perhaps the tendency uh, for a monopoly of biomedical models of what it means to care for a, um, a person who is aging. Um, there's also uncertainties about biomedical versus personal life-centered care. Um, the tensions in care relationships, we know that our care support is dwindling in this society and um, um, we need to enlist home and community care professionals, low-cost migrant labor and, and, and volunteers to come in together to, to help with the care of those who are aging. Uh, there are also issues about newly aged poor, which I think our government is, is really uh, addressing very carefully, and in fact, some people say, you know, the very poor in Singapore live better than those who are sort of in between, <laughs> right? Um, there are tensions over the distribution of care responsibilities, coordination issues among legacy systems, and uncertain responsibilities of professional and non-professional caregivers, which need to be clarified. In the report, we propose ethical standards and responsibilities for securing the agency, well-being, and safety of aging adults living at home, good relationships and good lives for informal and formal caregivers, solidarity and justice for aging adults and their care partners. Now, there are five uh, points that I'm going to make in the course of this lecture, and I'll start with the first one. So, supporting agency and preventing harm. Um, let me start by focusing on the importance of maintaining dignity and capabilities as key aspects of agency as people age. I draw attention to the work of my colleague, philosopher and bioethicist Nancy Jecker from the University of Washington in Seattle, who discerns a shift in values from midlife to late life and explains its significance for bioethics in her book, Ending, Ending Midlife Bias, New Values for an Aging Society. Um, so I read from this slide. During early life, caring, trust, and nurturing ought to figure prominently due to the vulnerabilities and needs that characterize infancy and childhood. By young adulthood, the capacity to develop greater physical and emotional independence makes autonomy a focal value. During later life, we face heightened risk of chronic disease and disability, which makes maintaining capabilities central in the face of loss and keeping dignity intact. So talking to older adults, we may encounter a shift in their concerns from autonomous decision-making to asking support for maintaining remaining capabilities with dignity at the front of their minds. So what is dignity? Jekka explains that our integral human uh, capacities confer on us a kind of dignity. So when a previously healthy adult can no longer dress or make a meal independently or control bowel or blad or, or control their bowel or bladder, they suffer a loss of dignity. We know that toddlers lack such independence, but these are not indignities for them. So what threatens dignity varies with age. Dignity, she says, is based on one's rightful standing among others. And dignity comes under threat when an individual's ability to do and be plummets below floor level. And human dignity at any age deserves protection. In this book, Jekka introduces a very interesting dignity-guided method for helping clinicians and care professionals to address geriatric syndromes. She demonstrates its use in a condition like um, dementia. Right? Uh, let me just talk about um, the geriatric syndromes. Right? The geriatric syndromes lead to the loss of various central capabilities. Maintaining integral capabilities can be guided by the goal of preserving dignity. Examples of such syndromes include frailty, functional decline, incontinence, falls, pressure ulcers, dementia, etc. And these are not single dis disease diagnoses, and they defy standard clinical guidelines. She provides this dignity-guided method. Instead of our more familiar case method, um, 
uh, that we know uh, and use every time at these conferences for addressing paradigmatic geriatric syndromes such as dementia where central capabilities are at risk. The method focus on, focuses on, for example, a paradigmatic case of dementia and interprets ethical issues and practice guidance in three steps. Jekka draws a list of human capabilities from the philosopher Martin Nussbaum, whose capabilities theory in turn stemmed from the theory of development economics uh, um, propounded by the Nobel laureate, Nobel laureate uh, Amartya Sen. So I apologize for getting a little bit into philosophy speak here, but what Sen emphasized was that capabilities are neither outcomes like well-being, nor are they like opportunities. Rather, they are dispositions that we have to be or to act in a certain way and to understand capabilities, people's capabilities, enables us to respond more actively to a person as an agent with freedom and has, hence respect their basic dignity as persons. So if we look at um, this simple schema, you'll see that the, the capabilities here listed um, are around 10. Um, we have, um, okay, so, sorry, let me just move on. We have a list of human capabilities. The capability of thinking about one's life as an unfolding story or narrative that can go well or not. We have the capability of maintaining health, enjoying our bodily integrity, of our senses of imagination and thought, of emotions and practical reasoning, the capability of affiliation to others, friendship, for example, appreciation of nature and play, and one's environment and place. These are all human capabilities that confer dignity on every person, whether or not they uh, have uh, cognitive, they are cognitively well or have cognitive impairment. Um, this sort of holistic view of the human person uh, is what Jekka and Martha Nussbaum, Amartya Sen have been talking about. So, um, I'm sorry for going back to that slide. Um, what you see there on the ticks are the capabilities at risk, most at risk for persons with dementia, right? Life, health, bodily integrity, sense, imagination, and thought, practical reason, affiliation, environment. However, you'll see that there are some that are still quite intact. Um, emotions, uh, the sense of uh, joy, for the appreciation of nature and play and so on, right? So here, the, the stuff in the brackets are some suggest, there's some suggested guidance for helping the person to maintain what is uh, slowly being lost in order to try to keep that as in a stable position as possible so that the person uh, remains, uh, you know, keeps their, their personhood and dignity in a, in a good position for as long as possible. Yeah. So we've mentioned the goals of supporting agency and preventing harm, and now we can easily identify some ethical issues in this domain. So um, in this domain, you can see that there are trade-offs between liberty and safety that we have to think about. Protection, of, protection from the deprivation of liberty and um, continuing support as people may see decline in mental capacity. And then on the right-hand side of this chart, the simple chart, we think about whether aging and place is viable for a person and what sorts of um, professional support we, for clients and non-professional caregivers um, we can give in daily risk management, uh, public investment in age-friendly environments, equipping homes with you know, grab bars, non-slip uh, tiles, and so on. 
Um, and then the protection from deprivation of liberty. Um, we could look into professional monitoring and support for older adults and caregivers who are under stress, and also um, understand a little bit more about adult protection under the Vulnerable Adults Act. For mental capacity and continuing support, uh, we give continuing attention. There is continuous research on the effectiveness of advanced care planning and, and, and how to improve um, that and I think there are moves towards a shared decision making model, a continuous practice of shared decision making between the doctor, the patient, and the family. Um, and also, um, we have, of course, our um, Mental Capacity Act, which you are all very familiar with. Let's turn next to supporting and sustaining care relationships. And here I want to dwell on what it means to build trust. Firstly, in interpersonal, community, and professional relationships. And then secondly, in care systems. What is trust or trust in relationships? Trust is reliance on others' competence and willingness to look after rather than harm the things that one cares about, which we have entrusted to their care. It's predicated on more than reliability because we can rely on others without trusting them. And it implies that we accept our vulnerability to another person's power and a risk of being harmed when we trust them. Right? So what reasons would justify us in tr um, taking risk of trusting other, another person? Surely it is because we desire the goods of intimacy, care and friendship, or public security requires us to trust strangers to an extent, or um, we trust in peace settlements, right? For peace settlements, we, we, we need to trust our enemies you know, to limit their power to harm us. So why would we, then on the other hand, right? why would we rationally accept the position of a trusted person? Why would we accept discretionary power over things that someone cares about? Um, when that can open us to potential accusations of abuse or breach of trust, so that's also because we have shared interests with one another. We share the concerns of the person that, you know, ha that trusts us. Um, and our professional values, what we've been trained to do, also um, uh, directs us to accept the responsibility of trust. And overall social good, our sense of what the kind of society we want to live in, uh, makes us willing to accept that responsibility. Right? So trust is much easier to maintain than it is to get started. And it's also very easy to destroy. At the interpersonal level, trust can be lost due to the trustee's actions. For example, um, if we don't have the moral competence to interpret well a person's concerns, or we take on more than what we're entrusted with. So for example, a befriender not only gives me company, but tries to remove the source of my problems, okay, <laughs> and interferes too much, right? Or bystanders who are supposed to keep a friendly eye on my safety, but they won't leave me alone, you know, to walk in peace by myself. Um, and uh, also misreading the bounds of entrusted discretionary power. For example, a, confident, a confidant fails to judge how to receive confidential information and when to share it. Relationships of trust can also fail due to the truster. The truster's action, if, if we, as the person who's being cared for, are very rigid and we have very unforgiving attitude when you know, a trustee makes a mistake, right? Um, we need a good judgment to know how much discretion to give people when to forgive them, and, and trustees should not be oversensitive as well. You know, when 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 a person's being careful gets a little bit annoyed, uh, you know, at at the moment, right? It doesn't mean that they've lost trust in you. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, as people who who give trust, sometimes we have a lack of tact in dealing with well-meant but ill-judged decisions about care or minor instances of incompetence, right? So this calls for a lot of wisdom and moral competencies as we age. If you look at the cartoon there, this guy is hovering over you know, the, 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 the other person saying, um, there's no hyphen in, um, look, my eyes are killing me, okay, <laughs> in micromanager. There's no hyphen in micromanager, okay. <laughs> Um, so, trust, um, I'd like to also say, is a dynamic within relationships. You know, 
we don't usually explicitly consent to somebody else's discretionary power, right? Um, we, we just do it as a matter of course. We don't have to say very much. But the trusting nature of a relationship develops through risky acts and decisions that test mutual understanding and concern. Um, either confirming that a person really has these concerns and, there's a, and they trust us to act in this way or that way. Uh, and, and as we go along, that reinforces mutual trust. This person really knows me. This person really understands me and is able to respond to what I need. Um, so it could either re reinforce mutual trust um, or um, refute or damage that trust. So it is a dynamic process and we, we don't sort of draw clean cut things or I trust you, I don't trust you, right? Yeah, we develop that over time. That's really important for us to understand um, um, at home as family caregivers, as, as professional caregivers, and so on. The range of interdependent care relationships that people need as they grow older can be quite wide, and the simple chart it, uh, it will indicate that for, sorry, for people growing older, um, we need to establish new dimensions of long-standing relationships with doctors, family members, employers, neighbors, friends, community, duties of citizenship. We need to do that now, <laughs> right? Because trust is built over a lifetime. For older adults with greater dependence on others for care needs and arrangements, often a spouse or adult child bears the main responsibility by default, but there are ethical dimensions to this. Um, it is much better to aim for shared family responsibility, community responsibility, shared financial responsibility, and um, access to care support in the community and government safety nets. Here too, we see shifts happening in professional practice. In clinical ethics, healthcare professionals build trust in the professional patient relationship by demonstrating competence and acting in the best interest of the patient. But sustaining the patient's relationship with caregivers and helping them to maintain trust in professional patient caregiver team is vital for better outcomes in long-term care. So for example, it is well established that caregiver burnout is a risk factor for negative outcomes in persons with dementia. Um, sometimes the caregiver is a migrant domestic worker and professionals need to learn how to work with a domestic worker and to understand the pressures that they come under. Um, there's been a lot of attention, a lot of work here in this society to improve the conditions of work for, for domestic workers, but here let's, let's just you know, review some things. There is unclear scope often uh, for the work of the migrant domestic worker. They sometimes have to do nursing care, do medical appointments, and do household chores. Their roles and expectations are not clearly distinguished from family caregivers and home care nurses, and yet they lack authority and are expected to fill many of these roles. Um, they're not protected under our Manpower Act, unlike other workers in Singapore, on the grounds that work in home settings is hard to regulate. There's a separate part of the Manpower Act. I mean, there's a separate section, right, for, for um, migrant workers. Um, although, of course, um, here are things that we can do to support them. Um, professionals can support families by clarifying the scope of care responsibilities of informal caregivers. Um, professional and, and, and uh, you know, introduced professional services in the home can direct employers of migrant domestic workers to attend caregiver training programs, which we're already doing, and review of the enforcement of migrant domestic worker rights under the law and continuing employment tra uh, employment, employer training and uh, education. Families do need help to reframe relationships at home as their members age. Um, adults growing older may be uncertain how to alert family members to their changing needs. They may worry about being a burden to their adult children who are working and raising families. They also worry about whether their children will value the ideals that they have lived by and continue to live by. For their part, adult children may find it difficult to understand the needs of an aging parent or those of a parent who is a primary caregiver of a spouse in poorer health. So, you know, often, I mean, I, I just heard just now at breakfast a story about, um, you know, a, 
an, an older woman uh, who's been so used to hosting. But when children come to the, to the house, they say, here, mom, you know, let us help with the hosting. <laughs> and so, you know, what's intended as help actually leaves the person a bit bereft as to what to do now, what do I do with myself, right? And, and so these are the kinds of things that are hard for people to talk about. It's like, there are these changes in myself. Can I, how can I communicate that this is what I would like and this is what I'd like to continue to do? So opportunities for sharing insights among peers, whether these are older adults, family caregivers, or foreign domestic workers should be supported in public policy making so that people with common experiences can be strengthened by one another. Uh, here is where the insights from existential gerontology can be very helpful. Um, existential gerontology, it draws from the findings of gerontology to devise reflective and practical strategies for those facing personal struggles with living in old age. For example, I'd like to highlight the work of Paul and Margaret Baltes, who found in their research of um, the, the pattern of uh, behavior in, in older adults, a pattern of selection, optimization, and compensation in older adults um, for, 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 for adapting to increasing physical and mental uh, limitations. So they tell the story of the pianist Rubenstein, right? So Rubenstein got older and older, and you know, in his 80s, right, he said, well, how do I continue playing piano? He says, now I only play Chopin. And um, because technically uh, I, my fingers are not so quick, so for the slow sections, I really do, you know, I, I pour all my emotion and, and interpretation into the piece, right? And everyone's, you know, carried away. And then when in the faster sections, I, I, I play slower, in objectively slower, but because of the contrast, they think that I'm still very technically uh, uh, in, uh, adept. So <laughs> this, is, this is the kind of thing that, um, they, these are examples that they give of how uh, people might benefit from understanding what they can do, you know, as they as they age and, and face certain limitations. So um, let me move on at the system level. Care systems can damage trust between professionals and clients or patients for reasons that are not interpersonal but systemic, such as fragmented and confusing care systems. Um, where there's a lack of clear responsibilities, staff shortages, no time for training, financing structures that entrench privilege. These system level problems may create permissive circumstances in which um, abuse can occur because you know, there is a view that some people are not valued you know, within the system. And if that happens, then um, professionals cannot account for trust, their own trustworthiness. Um, and regulation cannot do the work that it's meant to do to protect patients from um, poor professional performance. So what do we do? Um, here, there are ethical dimensions of systems supporting home and community care. Uh, what makes systems trustworthy? Um, in that 2017 report, we highlighted certain ethical dimensions of systems that are built to support care at home, like reducing service gaps, duplication silos, legacy problems. And you know that in this developing landscape, uh, Singapore is doing a whole lot to, to you know, really address these uh, uh, issues very um, carefully and uh, you know, with great attention to the needs of um, people in, the aging, in an aging society here. Not pushing the hospital into the home, so you've got all these home care services that are being developed, um, AACs and so on, uh, to provide respite for caregivers. Improving transparency and equity uh, financing for financing care at home. So ours is a system of transition from meeting the needs of younger to a younger population to an aging population, AIG, AIC has been developing and coordinating care services and financial subsidies and schemes to meet the needs of an aging population. And the healthcare system is now strengthening primary care by preparing family physicians to play a big role in preventive care, encouraging patients to undertake health screening, adopt healthier lifestyles, and installing 10 patient care networks island-wide for supporting GPs in the administrative work, screening, home visits, and patient counseling. Um, here are the features of professional trustworthiness and accountability. Um, we see that um, when a system shows intelligence, it reduces meaningless, time-consuming work for stakeholders. Um, competence, uh, where you 
work at stemming poor performance without damaging good performance. Care, reliability, and honesty, not just ticking boxes. Yeah. Communication, not just putting information out there to be transparent, but getting it to where people are, making sure they know where to go for help. A simplification to reduce misunderstanding or confusion, and reality testing with frontline workers and patients and clients. So these aspects of system trustworthiness were really tested during the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak. And here I think you know, we can see um, that on top of preparing for the needs of an aging population, we saw that COVID spurred us on now, also to have to contend with a world where cycles of infectious disease pandemics are expected. And to maintain trust in the health and social care system, there will be a need to think about preparing and securing adequate resource for healthcare, new modes of care like home-based care, telemedicine, digital health. It's already underway, as you heard uh, Mr. Chua mention. Specific interventions for the needs of the vulnerable to enable monitoring um, for safety, inclusion, and resilience. Curbing social inequalities by aiming for equality in health and enhancing mobility by tackling crowding on public transport, building ventilation systems that reduce transmission of disease and so on. Okay. Um, so in summary, aging in place brings many uncertainties, challenges, and policy responses. Aging issues bring a new lens to healthcare ethics. Maintaining age, agency capabilities and dignity are important goals of care as people age. Health and social care integration requires supporting not only health care needs, but a person's long-term care choices, care support relationships, and places of care. Aging in place requires strengthening relationships of trust at home and in the community and in care systems. My final slide here is to um, just give you an overview of the case mix for this conference. Panel one focuses on maintaining dignity and capabilities and what that might mean as people age. Right. And panel two, we look at vulnerability to abuse and neglect um, as dependency on others increases. Then we look at panel, uh, panel three is uh, focuses on preparing for more dementia as life expectancy rises. And finally, in panel four, we look at the issue of loneliness as we experience changes in ourselves and our relationships in the life course. So with that, I just want to say thanks for your attention. And uh, I'm not sure if there's any question, time for questions, but uh, you know, I'd really, yeah.